Yeah. I mean, we can go as technical as you want. I mean, a fund in the most basic sense, you guys talk about is just a pool of capital, right? You're just raising capital and you're going to go buy real estate in your example. A fund between syndications and funds, kind of the big difference is a syndication is typically done deal by deal basis. <laughs>
Um, same thing with traders. Hey, I've been trading my own money for, you know, I've got 200 grand. I trade my own money. I've been killing it. I now want to raise 20 million and trade with other people's money. Or I've, we, uh, we actually, the other group we have is entrepreneurs. So the other group we have is people that run a business. Hey, I run, well, actually one of our clients, he, was, he runs a gun store. Say, so, Hey, I run this gun store. It does well. I want to buy out my competitors in the state. So what he did, he's like, dude, I want to raise like 10 million bucks and I can buy out the four biggest competitors in my state. And I will have essentially a monopoly on my state for gun sales. I was like, cool, that's awesome. So it's a private equity play. We've seen a lot of people do that with restaurants or car washes or like small tier. It's actually really cool. Uh, these little niche funds that people have. One guy was doing funeral homes. He'd buy out funeral homes and flip them. He could double the value in about 12 months. So we have a lot of people. Yes, it's traditional like multifamily real estate fund, but there's a lot of people that are in these like really cool niches um, that just needs more capital to scale. Is, so that's the ideal person. We help people do syndicates and all sorts of other cool stuff, but that's the ideal person. Yeah. Does the, does the type and, and the, the way you raise capital change when you move to a fund or it, you basically, whoever does a syndication before just does more of that. It's just that the, 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 the legal vehicle is going to be now fund, or do you introduce them to a type, a new type of fundraising, private equity or, or anything like, like that? Yeah. Great question. So uh, yeah, the answer is yes to both. It depends on what works for you and where you want to go. Oftentimes, the same investors that invest you with in syndicates will probably invest with you with a fund. Now, some might say, I don't want to do a fund or whatever. You just say, tough. Hey, if you want it, we're the best in the business. If you want to work with us now, we're going to use a fund because it gives, first off, you a lot of benefits. You're diversified amongst deals. You're safer legally. I don't know if you've been in a syndicate where uh, partners try to sue each other, depending on how you set up your syndicate, some are set up kind of loose and you can get into pretty bad legal deals. If somebody's trying to be strong arms, somebody else out, a fund protects you from other investors. Anyways, a lot of pros there. So again, it can be the same investors. Oftentimes though, the fund, and maybe it's not your first fund, but it grows into a second or a third or fourth fund. You then can go to large family offices and institutions. They're, they become now, okay, this person is an, uh, and they're not just doing deal by deals. They're doing a full fund. We want to allocate 20 to $40 million into this group. Um, that's kind of the tier that you start getting to um, through the fund vehicle. So what are some of the pros of a fund? And, and maybe talk about some of the cons as well, because it's probably yeah. not for, for, for everyone. And, and there's probably some cons, some downsides of doing a fund. Talk, talk about some of the pros and cons of, uh, of a fund. Yeah. Yeah. Great question. So pros and cons. So let's just do syndicates versus funds. So syndicates really easy, fast to set up. Typically I would say relatively inexpensive and investors like coming a lot of times, like I'm on this deal or I'm investing directly into a property. They can see it. It's tangible. You're going to go pitch them like, Hey, we got this thing in Dallas, Texas, it's 20 units. We're going to buy it. So those are the pros of a syndication. The cons of a syndication would be uh, investors can kind of sue each other, depending on how you set it up, can sue each other. Sometimes you get on the hook, uh, for some liabilities in that, in that deal. And then oftentimes it's, it's sometimes not scalable, right? It's hard to do a deal and you gotta just close that deal, do the next one. It's, it's hard to scale. You don't get as many. And then anyways, that kind of contrasts back to the fund pros and cons. So a fund pro would be scalability you can take down bigger deals with more money. You can pull in bigger amounts of capital and have a, a real big system around it. Um, legal protection is way better in a fund. Um, now, depending on how you set up your syndication, but typically fund protection is way better between investors suing you, suing other investors. I mean, it's, it's really a way better protection for you. And then um, third, you get access to usually better credit from banks. You get way better financing. You get better terms, better loans, all that kind of stuff from banks in a fund just because you're bigger. And then um, I, I think I, I can't remember what I got out of order, but um, access to larger capital, right? And diversified across number of properties. So your investors now are, if you have a hundred properties, yeah, five will go bad. Five will do amazing. And, you know, 90 will be in the middle and you get diversified across all those properties. So cons of a fund, more expensive, a little more time to set up and investors are investing into a pool of money, uh, not investing into a direct, pro direct property. So a little bit harder usually to raise capital a little bit. Depends on, now it just depends on syndications, funds and the fund manager. But those are kind of some some pros and cons. If I'm, I'm talking quick, hopefully that that uh, you guys I don't know if you got that down, but that would that would be a few things. So Bridger, one one uh, common thing that that we as well you know, we kind of go back and forth on is well we have a lot of repeat investors on the syndication side. They get excited about that deal and then they'll come in you know 
three, four, five times in a year into different syndications that come in versus if we just did a fund and we pool all those properties together, we may only get one investment from them. So how do you, how do you, how do people look at that? How do they overcome that issue? I mean, talk to us a little bit about that. So it depends on your investor. Um, some investors like to like, it sounds like your investor likes to see the deal. They get excited about it. They want to put money into that deal. Um, I'm guessing that now it depends on your investors. You could come to that same investor and say, Hey, last year you invested in five times. We're going to, instead of bugging you every single month about a new investment, you got to hop on a zoom call. A lot of investors don't want to be bugged. They just want to write a check and get out of it, you know, and get and just put their money to work. Um, say come in our, come in our fund. We're going to do the same number of deals we did last year, but now we're just grouping them all in a fund. It's going to be way easier for you. You can write one, you can give one subscription at the beginning and then move on. Additionally, investors can do increases of their subscription. So if they start out with $100,000 and then two months later, hey, I got some more money, they can actually increase their subscription to just add more to the fund as it goes. Um, and you can decide that. So if you had, if your investor is investing five times, they want to do that schedule in the future, cool. Yeah, we knew that in our fund. You just do it. You fill out a little form. You're going to increase your capital subscription every quarter and you just increase there. So you can, you can do the same thing there. Um, I've seen investors that don't want to be bugged every quarter about a new investment, right? Stop bugging me. Just get my money to work. Some like to be on the deal. Um, but tr usually it's easier for the, the managers, you guys. It's a lot easier. You're not having to build a deck and repitch the same group. Okay, do you guys want to come in on the next one? Okay, capital get, due on Friday. But if they get excited about that, how do you overcome it in, in the fun setting? If it's Because it's one time, right? So if they're like, oh yeah, there's another deal. I mean, it's, so it's, you're, I guess you're saying it's just kind of, based on the investor and what their, their kind of needs are because it's fun is more set it and forget it. Um, but for the, you know, for the investor and now you can, you can do investor reporting as much as you want. So I see some funds that are active on that every month. They're like, here's a cool new video. And we've just bought this new deal. It's awesome. Like you guys are in the fund. Congrats. Like we just got this great deal. So they just do marketing. Um, typically though, keep that excitement. You, yeah. I'm just telling you though, most fund managers I see just they're trying to scale. They're trying to get now hundreds or thousands of investors. And so they're, they're less concerned about the hype. And usually the hype investors are usually the smaller investors. The bigger investors, the bigger you get, usually the less hype is involved in the investors, <laughs> at least in my experience, right? Um, and it's usually, you guys know this, it's usually the small investor that's the one that bugs you the most. The, the guy that gave you like a $20,000 check is usually the one that's bugging you every day about their money. The guy that writes you a $2 million check is like, cool, I'm good. Let me know when I get the money back, right? So. so Anyways, so what I'm help answer that question, what I'm but again, it depends say, on the investor. So yeah, if if you so you have if you have to educate your investors, hey, we're not going to come to you four times a year. So so one thing, what, you know, what's your allocation for the year? Let's get your your get your commitment down, and uh, you can increase your subscription one time. Um, and so that's that makes a lot of sense. Well, not not necessarily. Let me just clarify too, Michael. You can do whatever you want in a fund. The best part about funds, you write the rules. If you want to come to them four times a year and get new subscriptions, you can do that. You write that in your little LPM PPM. Like it's totally fine to do it. I'm just telling you most don't, but you can do that if you'd like. You can come back to them. Hey, uh, we got new deals. We got a whole new deal flow coming in. Do you guys want to add more? Do you want to put some money? And you'll do capital calls as well. So you say, hey, you you committed a, a million dollars. We're going to call 25% now. We're going to call another 25%. Let me ask you about that. So, I was, I was going to ask you about that. I mean, one of the issues is, yeah. let's say in a syndication, you actually take the money in the escrow because you have a deal that's going to close in 30 days. But in a fund, let's say it's a $50 million fund and I buy a $25 million deal, I can't have $50 million in a bank because I don't have that second deal yet. So how do you address that? And it sounds like you're, instead of taking money per se, you get a legal commitment of some sort and then you do a capital call. How does that work? Yeah, great question. Again, you can decide how you want to do it. Most funds will do a capital call structure. So, hey, we have a deal lined up. We're going to call in 25% of our funds um, to do this deal, right? So you, you issue a capital call. They have 10 days to wire their money and they have a legal obligation to wire that money in. If they don't wire their money in, there's a huge penalty too. And they know about that. So they're, I mean, cause sometimes syndications I've, I've had some mentors, you know, it's like the Friday afternoon and the wire didn't hit right. And they miss it. Um, and so a lot of the times you'll do a capital call structure and they, you call the capital in, they wire their capital in. Um, and then they, uh, they go from there. Now, some funds take more money up front. Let's say they're a $50 million fund, like you said, and they know they're going to do they're doing like, let's call it a single family fund. They're going to do hundreds of deals, right? They'll just call in. Okay. We want to call in $15 million for the next six months. And they just start doing deals as many deals as they want. Um, some other funds, you also can set up lines of credit with banks. 
So a bank, so if you, let's say, um, you know, it takes, let's call it 14 days to do a capital call, but you got a deal that you want to close on in three days. Most banks with a fund will give you a line of credit for capital calls specifically. Like it's a it's specific just for capital calls. So they will say, hey, we'll give you a line of $25 million that you can use for 45 days pending that your capital calls will all hit and then you can repay us back. Um, very standard practice in funds so that, so that you can just transact. Because that's the, one of the biggest things is you want to make sure you transact and build a reputation. That's actually one of my mentors. He, uh, the reason he switched from syndications to funds was they had a deal. It was like an eight and a half million dollar deal. One of their investors didn't wire in the last 250 grand. They missed the deal. It hurt their reputation. And they were like, man, we, we can't do this anymore. We have to have a structure that's designed where we can close, we can transact, we can do more deal flow and we're going to win better properties. The other thing I was, I was going to say, another actually guy, they run a multi-billion dollar real estate fund. He was telling me, he's like, we win deals usually three to 4% lower than the highest bidder because we run a fund. I was like, what do you mean? And he goes, let's just, for a broad example, let's say it's a hundred million dollar property we're trying to take down. We'll bid uh, 96 million and somebody else builds a builds hundred million. But our 96 million is backed by a fund and they know we can transact. They know all the deals we've ever done. Because a, a, a deal isn't just about money, it's about terms, right? And so the terms, they go, a syndication will come build a bit of hundred million, but they're going to try to call everybody up and they have 60 days to close. We'll close in 14 days and they know we'll close at 96 million. They typically will sell us the, the deal and they'll, they're, they're okay with that. And we win deals at discounts because of a fund. So now again, I want us to clarify, we teach funds. We also teach syndications though. Syndications are awesome. I'm not saying syndications are bad. Syndications are really great. They're just, they're just pros and cons to both. And we help people do both. So Bridger, yeah. how do you see a lot of people structuring their funds? Like what, give us some of the kind of the, the splits or the prefs involved. What does it look like typically? Mm -hmm. So primarily on like the waterfall structure. Um, so yeah, most, and I, let's just use real estate since you guys are talking real estate. Uh, a lot of funds I will see do uh, around a 2% management fee on uh, capital raised and that's capital called and deployed too. They then will do an 8% pref. So sorry, let me back up a little bit. What we're talking about here is returns. So it's people that don't know what I'm talking about. So uh, let's just say an example, let's say our fund, we have a real estate fund. It produced a 22% return just total for the fund. How does that get split between managers and investors? How does everyone get paid? It's kind of what we're talking about. It's called a waterfall distribution. So um, typically they tier it out. Um, so what I was saying was an 8% pref. So a lot of funds that I see in real estate, they do first 8% goes to the investor. So what they'll say is, hey, if our fund makes a 7% this year, all 7% goes to you as the investor. We don't make any money on performance unless we get at least 8%. We want to beat the market. So that's called the, usually called a preferential rate of return or a pref is kind of the, the terminology. So a lot of, a lot of my seat is an 8% pref. They then will do a catch up. So let's just say, let's just use broad numbers. So let's say first 8% goes to the investor. Uh, ninth and 10th percentile come to me as the fund manager. So that would be a catch up. So now there's different ones you can do, but that's, that's the example would be like, so the, the full 8% and the full ninth percent come to me as the fund manager. And then on the example, let's say we got a 22% return. So we did first 8% to the investor, ninth and 10th percentile comes to me. And then from the 10th, now we're to 10 to 22, we split 80, 20. So 80% of that 12% next available. So 80% of the 10 to 22 goes to the investor and 20% comes to me as the fund manager running the fund. Um, I think the math comes out to like 4.4% or something and, and investors would take home like a 16 and a half. Anyways, I don't have the math in front of me, but 16 or 17%, they would take as their cash on cash return on the investment. You would take home a 4% uh, somewhere around there, four and a half percent. Um, and, uh, that's how you get paid, which is pretty awesome. So um, now other funds will also charge a management fee. Some do, some don't. They just charge a fee to like run the fund and keep it up. A lot of times it's 2%. So you'll hear from funds, they'll say a two and 20. It's a very common term. Like, hey, I run a two and 20 fund. It's usually a 2% management fee and 20% carried interest is what they call. So that 80-20 split, 20% would be what's called carried interest. Um, 
And by the way, that carried interest piece, and hopefully this is, maybe I'm talking too fast. We can clarify if we want to go back a little bit, but that carried interest, that 20%, this is why Harvard people, Stanford, they tooth and nail claw, they worked their way up for 20 years to make carried interest. I mean, that is their whole goal. You can make insane amounts of money on, and you might just say, well, we made 4%. Yeah, you made 4%, not on your own money though. You made 4% or four, maybe 5% on the entire fund. So if you had a $100 million fund, that would be four to $6 million. If you had a billion dollar fund, that would be 40 to $60 million. If you had a multi, you can just do the math, right? You're making that on the entire fund. That's why funds are so scalable. That's why people get just, they just love funds. They want how, to get that. Can you clarify how, the lower rate. clarify what, what you mean by carried interest? So carried interest is, so I mentioned earlier that 8% pref, the 2% mm-hmm. catch up, and then the, essentially the performance fees. So that 80, 20 split, that 20% is called carried interest is the, the terminology for it. So it's essentially the performance of your fund. So if the fund performs, I take 20% of them as the manager, that's called carried interest. That's actually taxed at a lower rate just so everyone's aware too. So the reason like Mitt Romney and Donald Trump and stuff pay really low in taxes Number one, they have a lot of real estate. Number two, they run funds. Those are not taxed at normal, ordinary income rates. They're taxed at cap, long-term capital gains rates. It's freaking amazing. And if you run a real estate fund, you can depreciate your real estate. And so your effective tax rate, like Mitt Romney was like, what, 4% or 5 6%? And people were all mad about it. And I was like, that's amazing, right? That's so cool. Um, the other thing that's interesting, um, and people say that's wrong. The, the IRS has incentivized entrepreneurs to take risk and run funds because carried interest gets taxed. They want people to take the risk. They want people to pool capital from foreign entities and other entities in the United States and do investments like this. And they'll, they'll give you a big tax break for doing it, which is pretty cool. Does that clarify? I don't know if I talked too fast, Gary. Is that good enough though? No, that's, um, that's good, man. Structure. Yeah. I, I wanted to understand how you're seeing a lot of these done and, um, I think that makes a lot of sense. So the language terminology is, it's a little bit different than some of the syndications and stuff like that, that we've seen, but it's really interesting to see how you guys position it uh, in this context. And it, it sounds like there's a lot of great advantages. The, the tax taxes thing, if clarifying that a little bit. So you said long-term capital gains versus short-term. Does, now, does that go into effect right away? So they j- Trump actually just changed this rule. So you have to hold the assets for three years um, in your fund. So real estate actually usually fits most people's timeline. If you hold the asset for three years, um, you pay, and they raised it from 20 to 25%. So you, Trump just did that um, right before he left office. So 20, you'll pay 25% on that uh, carried interest. The performance fees that you earn from your fund performing would be at that tax rate. Yeah. Does that Got make it. sense? Does that clarify? Yeah, yeah, that make that makes sense. Uh, so, j- just curious, Bridger, with with your new setup, and uh, you're so you're getting people into these funds, and uh, you know, what is a typical fund size? Someone that gets going with you? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, we help people all over the place. So I'll give you a few examples of just saying, like in real life, like what people are doing. We actually have a lot of people doing multifamily, uh, people doing mixed use, people doing storage units, people doing, I mean, all every little sector of real estate that you can imagine, we have people doing it. They are building, I mean, the coolest real estate projects you've ever seen. Um, most groups, I would say an average real estate size for us is 20 to 30 million would be an average target of capital raised. So they're how quick are they, how quick do they raise that typically? Now, again, everyone's different. Um, yeah. uh, I would say, you know, people that are raising anywhere from 10 to 20, it's usually uh, eight months, six to eight months, maybe a year they would go out and raise that. And now they can start buying stuff as they raise it. Um, now to clarify too, if you raise $10 million, you can lever that up. You can buy 40 to $50 million of real estate, right? That's $10 million of equity raised to lever up to, to a, a higher amount. So now we have people all over the board. We have some people raising 500 grand in a fund structure and they want to buy $3 million, right? Um, you know, we have people doing it all over the place. So a couple of people though, it's kind of cool outside of real estate. We have people doing solar farms. We have people raising funds to go and do solar farms. We have one of the, one of the guys in our group, he's the largest, um, 
let's see, largest hydrogen energy plant in America. They take cow manure and they turn it into hydrogen. He owns the largest facility. He wants to build two more facilities. He, he just raised um, initially 45 million that he was raising another 45 million last I spoke to him. It's pretty cool. cool. Uh, somebody else doing funeral homes to this guy in our group is crazy. He found that he could buy funeral homes, mom and pop funeral homes, and he could um, group them together under a, a it take him about 12 months, 18 months. He could sell them after putting them under, you know, economies of scale under one roof. He could sell them for about double of what he bought them for to a bigger private equity firm. So he, every year, every about 18 months, he buys about eight to $10 million of funeral homes. And he literally turns around and sells them for 16 to $20 million in 12 to eight months. He pays his investors back. He makes about a $2 million spread doing that every 18 months and just repeats it. That's like, so dude, crazy. that's amazing. It's so cool. <laughs> so it's <laughs> I like, love it. it's like one of those things. So you can do this in a lot of different industries, but if you pull up a bunch of types of businesses, it attracts a different buyer on the other side, right? So you're now you're getting looks from like hedge funds and, and larger money managers and stuff like that. that they're going to look at your business more seriously if you have that kind of scale and volume, which is pretty cool. Uh, that's yeah. that's exactly what you're talking about with that. <laughs> it's pretty fun. Um, and somebody else in our group, one more, I'll just say uh, they were buying Hollywood scripts from broke writers in Hollywood. Yeah. They'll buy a script for like 30 or 50 grand from them. And they'll turn around and sell them to HBO Max, Netflix, Amazon Prime, whatever video services. They sell them for two hundred to three hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> That's their entire fund. That's all they do. Like it's so cool. Like there's so many little niche funds. And like, anyways, we have funds doing real estate with like crypto mining. So they build mines. They own the real estate for crypto. I mean, there's just like every little niche of real estate you've ever seen. We have people doing. It's it's really fascinating. It's really cool. So. Oh, this, man. Has been, this has been a, a ton of fun, man. I, I, I love this kind of stuff. You know, it's a, it's next level stuff. Really love it. Um, how can people learn more about what you do and, uh, and the, the kind of training that you guys have? Yeah. So we have a free, like totally free course on funds. We actually put out, we have other stuff too. We have coaching groups and other stuff. We have a free course on funds. It's the best place if you want to learn about funds or learn more about what I'm talking about. If you go to fundlaunch.com, um, right there, you can just opt in. There's a free course and people might be asking, what's the catch? Like, why do you guys do this? We, we have, I think uh, like 10, I think it's maybe it's 12,000 people now in that free course. It's awesome. Um, and you opt in. My whole goal is I want to provide a ton of value up front. And really, I just want to educate people on funds. I run a fund. I make plenty of money running my fund. It's great. I really want to democratize this whole world of funds. And so we try to give a ton of value up front. And if people want to launch a fund or do their own fund, I, we hope that people remember us like, man, Bridger, that was awesome. Like their content they put out with fund launch was amazing. I'm going to call them. And, and we have groups, we have lawyers and we have all the, all the administrators, the accounting, the audits, like the sec stuff. We help people put that all together. Um, and obviously those are like, we have paid coaching groups and other stuff, but I tell everybody just go get the free course. It's funlaunch.com go right there and grab it. And, um, yeah, it's pretty, yeah, pretty fun. I love it so much, man. It's been great uh, jamming with you, Bridger. Great to have you on the show. Well, you guys are amazing. Michael and Garrett, thanks for having me on. This is a fun show. It was awesome.